So hello everyone, my name is Ricardo Gonzalez and I will be talking a bit more about myself in the coming slides. So today for the XR Access Research Network seminar, we have Dr. Raja Kushal Nagar and we are very happy to have him here today because he is the first um, speaker that has worked on something other than vision, which has been most of our most of our seminars. So yeah, we're very excited to have him here today. Um, so a bit brief introduction here. Uh, the research network right now is composed by Dr. Shiri Asenkot, uh, my advisor. She's one of the directors of the XR Access Initiative. Um, me, Ricardo Gonzalez. I'm a PhD student in, the Cor in Cornell Tech and I'm an accessibility researcher. And Nyla Wilson, another PhD student working with us, she couldn't be here today for positive reasons, but unfortunately she couldn't join us today. So hopefully next month we can see her, yeah. So a brief introduction for, uh, for people that haven't been involved uh, on the seminar before. So the XR Access community is a community that engages and connects and influences the field of XR. What does that mean? That means that we want to build and share knowledge, uh, share skills, tools, and experiences of the uh, community with different impairments to make VR and AR inclusive for all, regardless of ability and regardless of the application. Um, so one of the columns of the XR Access Network is the research network. So in the research network, we want to celebrate and share academic research. So today we are sharing, giving space to Raja to share about his research work and, and also spread his knowledge about, well, in this case, about deaf, deaf people. Um, so yeah, uh, today's speaker is Raja. Raja is professor and director of the information technology uh, department in the school of STAMP science, technology, accessibility, mathematics, and I forgot the last letter <laughs> right now, uh, in the Gallaudet University. O open access. Open access, open access, yeah. So Raja, Raja has a- Pub Public access. Oh, Interpreter. public access. No worries. So, so it's health? Health? Okay. Public health, interpreter error, I'm sorry. Okay, thank you so much, Lou and Raja. Um, so, and Raja has a long history of working with the deaf and hearing, hard of hearing community. Um, he himself is a deaf uh, researcher, so that gives him a unique insight into the problems and it's really valuable having his experience because he uh, can have deeper insights that as researchers, uh, we can get access to it. Um, he's also an advocate of uh, accessible um, policies, policy like pushing forward accessible computing to bring accessible technologies to mainstream technology. So please give a warm welcome to Raja and I will let him now uh, come uh, share his slides. Uh, um, okay. Meanwhile. I can't share my slides. You're going to have to give oh. me permission. Okay, give me one second. Oh, 
Sorry. Hey. I, th I think you I think you have access now, Raja. Do you not have? Ricardo, you might have to stop sharing first. Hold on. Oh, sorry. I haven't done this in a bit. Thank you, Dylan. So I had to fix my computer. I had a new computer, so hold on. Perfect. So meanwhile, meanwhile, Raja sets his screen up. Uh, feel free to ask any question. Uh, while we're presenting on the chat and at the end of the talk i can uh read the questions or well raja will be able to respond to your questions I have a question. I'm having problems with my computer. It's a new one. So um, can you share the slides? I believe that I sent them to you. Perfect. Uh, let me let me Long get them ago. quickly. Can you search for that? Let me get them quick. So can everyone see my screen? Yes, okay. So today I want to talk about how we are going to use multimedia design in 2D and XR. Specifically, I'm going to talk about how 2D impacts XR design. First though, more generally, when we talk about research and we talk about multimedia design in research, we talk about information being delivered in a logical way. Secondarily, we talk about information being delivered visually. However, there is a diversity of needs. We have deaf, hard of hearing, and hearing populations who rely on different modalities of communication. So those people that are hearing and sighted can hear everything and can see everything. However, people that have one or more sensory loss have to access information in a different way. Uh, next slide, please. So research tells us now that about 1 billion people worldwide have trouble either seeing or hearing or both. About 217 million people are blind and low vision. Less than that, about 36 million people are completely blind and about 360 million people are deaf and hard of hearing and of those 45 million are completely deaf. This does not include particular situations where for one reason or another, somebody's vision or hearing may be obscured temporarily. For example, some people have a hard time hearing in noisy situations, or some people have a hard time seeing something and listening to something at the same time. So one of their senses is impaired temporarily. This is only people that have permanent disabilities. There's a whole different group of people that have disabilities that are situationally based. Next slide, please, sorry. One of the most crucial things to remember is that there is no one 
uh, one solution. There's not a one size fits all when it comes to accessibility. The diversity and accessibility means there's going to be a diversity in opinion. Even people that have similar sensory disabilities, for instance, two people that are both deaf or hard of hearing are not going to have the same opinion about what their needs are. Everybody is operating within their own parameters when they see and hear best. So there's no one best way to present information. There's no one best representation of somebody who is deaf or hard of hearing or blind or low vision. So everything here really serves as guidelines, more like recommendations. And it's important that we stay flexible and can accommodate to what individual needs are. Next slide. So I want to talk a little bit about the difference between receiving information auditorily and receiving information visually. Suppose somebody is deaf and wants to have information that's delivered auditorily to them delivered visually instead, or the opposite. Someone has trouble accessing information visually, they prefer to get everything auditorily. But it would be ideal if there was some sort of one-to-one -one map where you can map on auditory information visually and visually auditorily. People think there is that solution, but it really doesn't exist. It's not that simple just to change the modality and deliver information in the same way. For example, if someone relies on their hearing, it operates more like a bubble. So it's an inverse relationship. The person's ability to hear falls off at twice the distance, or at, sorry, at twice the rate of the distance between two people. So the farther, uh, the farther you are away from somebody, the harder it is to hear them. This is where how people are able to have conversations privately if they move farther enough away from somebody. So it makes sense when you're talking about auditory information, but to put things visually, there's a lot of different considerations. So this impacts things like caption design, it impacts interpreting, it impacts visual information design, all of these things that are normally delivered auditorily but now have to be delivered visually need to be reconsidered. And the inverse is true as well. Next slide. So this slide is all about visual perception. Visual perception, on the other hand, has different uh, parameters. So, The ratio of the distance to someone's vision is different than the ratio of distance to their hearing. So that bubble doesn't exist. That inverse relationship doesn't is not a two to one relationship. So if you're twice as far away from someone, you see something at half the size, rather than if you're twice as far away from someone, you hear it at a quarter of the volume. It's not as easy to see things that are far away, but it's more of a linear relationship. So it's harder to deliver information privately, visually, because you can see better farther away than you can hear. Also, if someone is not watching something, they can't see it. 
that's different than if you're getting information auditorily. Somebody can be next to you or behind you and you can still get information via sound. If someone is next to you or behind you, you can't see what it is that is in that space. So if you think about somebody who's blind or low vision, if they're getting information auditorily, things like how far away they are from the source of information have to be reconsidered because they are now losing information at twice the rate than they would be if they were relying on their vision. So next I wanna talk about how we take some of these things into consideration. It's important that we set our expectations for what this visual and audiological information will look like. Next slide, please. So if you have a person who's hard of hearing, the information may be jumbled, it may be garbled, they may need some type of visual support. If you see clearly the two paragraphs, the first paragraph may be what a hard of hearing person hears, but with the appropriate visual support, they would hear the second paragraph, which is what they were actually supposed to be hearing. So this takes in, this comes into play when you talk about something like closed captioning, somebody who's listening to the television and reading captions at the same time. So the point is not to have something be 100% visual or 100% auditory, but we need to meet the diverse needs of the individuals that we are serving. It's an important philosophy to keep in mind in general, but for now, more simply, it's just important to think about things not from a completely audiological, not from a completely visual perspective, but as incorporating both modalities to accommodate a wider variety of people. Because the degree to which people have hearing loss and vision loss also changes. So, I'm gonna focus a little bit more now on the, the support for those who are deaf and hard of hearing. Next slide, please. So to summarize everything up to this point, when we're talking about communication or we're talking about information delivery, we need to focus on maximizing and getting the most benefit out of somebody's auditory and visual perception. And that's going to be dependent on the individual. We're reliant on the individual to tell us what they need. Next slide, please. So I wanna explain a little bit about captioning and interpreting. So captioning is a visual, a visual representation of spoken words. It's not, um, it's, not a, it's not a great design for stakeholders, but it's what's been around for 40 years. People have relied on clo closed captioning because it's easy to follow. There's different forms of captioning. Sometimes they come up on the screen, but if there are no captions, something can be more difficult to follow. So if you um, click on the slide, there's a little recording that plays, like a little short little video. If we go ahead and click. Oh no, go back. Um, there should be. No, I don't see any 
Why don't you play? Oh, uh, wait. It does say. Right. It does say wait. Um, but I don't know why it's not playing it. Uh, that's okay. I can expand a little bit. Okay. Um. Sorry about that. Okay, so this is this is about eye gaze. So what the video shows is where someone is looking. So as the captions come up, a person's eyes move from word to word to word. So you'll notice their eyes track across the screen as the captions appear. So now the page on the right side is blank, but that's what you would have seen was the, was the eye tracking. So on the, on, on the right side of the page is where the words would come up. So on the previous slide, you would have seen that these, the eyes follow the captions. So the eyes are reading English language linearly. That can become really tiring because you have to constantly follow the words that are appearing on screen. And only one or two lines appear at a time. So there's, that's helpful because it's a little bit less fatigue on the eyes and you're more focused on what is there in the moment. So that is how captions are different than using an interpreter or how captions translate auditory uh, information visually. Next slide. So then when you often, when the interpreter is signing, they're watching the language, they're making communication easily, they're setting everything up around the entire face, um, they're capturing the entirety of the communication without the, with the eyes moving. And that means that it's easier to follow. It's not as tiring. And it tends to be a red dot, a positive there because you're not moving so much. And then there's better communication because it's visual. They can follow how it follows how the eyes actually work. So next slide, please. So here you can see everything there. Okay, so I'm showing how the, the entirety, the positive, the different ways that the eye is expanding everything. When they look at different things, then to you, that's important to consider in the XR design because we have to know where to see things and also we're taking information and we're using that information. We're looking back and forth, distance, close up, that sort of thing. So when we're thinking about XR design and switching to auditory information, that's what we're looking at. Next slide, please. So then to discuss about how important it is to design with visual data, more important than designing for others, because it's very often, if the design is for everybody else, then it's not truly understood what the design is impact is on the everyday life. Every day we use, it's very mm, it, sort of sad, but okay, for example, if somebody's signing with their hands, with gloves on, the signing gloves, 
it shows a theory that they have to catch what's on the fingers and the movement. But it's just a small part of the sign, of sign language. So signing gloves don't, um, aren't exactly capturing sign language. Yet, every year, some new student cre invents, creates signing gloves. And they say, oh, success, success. We've switched everything around, signing to signing, signing English. That's not clear. So it's a limitation, yes, and it helps. It gets, it meets some of the needs for deaf people, but not all of them. And they receive applause and everything for saying, yes, we've solved this problem for the deaf and hearing people, the communication needs. But it's not true, truly so. It's part of it, how um, the thinking about design impacts. So it's the same for sure for the XR design. And when we have the need for that design policy also for the signs for deaf people, whatever, exactly when that's captured their needs in their design. So that's saying we move to this captioning to the next slide, then we measure it, we do the technology, and it's very inventive professionally, and it's more than just one. The design is on their experience. If they're not thinking about the other person's perspective. So that has to be included in there either but the the participatory design or and the design meaning repeat re repetition that development or co-designs where the answers are put together with the, inv the inventions themselves so that there's an equality there. There are many different ways to involve that design and I'm pro providing two, neither might be successful, but whatever, choosing two that must continue to be included in the consideration, in the ideas, in the experience, in the design. If it's not, then secondly, the consideration of solving and finding a better, smoother way to translate. For example, captioning now, 30 years ago, it was only for deaf and hard of hearing people. That was it. Now, times have changed and things have gotten better and better. And the majority of people who use it are hearing. And they use, many use it for many different reasons because English is a second language or because there's a lot of noise around, ambient noise, or there are many different TVs going at once. There are many reasons. Or they don't wanna hear something 40% of Netflix users now actually used captioning. So the percentage of deaf is 2%. So that means that there's great, great, great majority of users now who are using captioning who are hearing. And again, back to that point of design for For different users, 
designed for all humans. So I want to um, really impress upon you the point that the, how important the design is. Next slide, please. So the captioning is about how the design is different. If it's not limited to one way, for example, 100 years ago, they had silent movies, no auditory at all. So those movies were fully for deaf and hearing people both. The design was different in the old days. There weren't captions. They had inter titles so that they would go up and explain what was going on. And then the actors would have the action and that would continue. And then it would go back and forth between the title the titles and the action. So it was a visual communication. But when you add auditory, then it becomes two separate things at one time. That's fine, that's good, but it switched the design. So in the old days, a hundred years ago, they added the auditory one to two years and it was all the movies became talkies. And deaf people lost their access to movies. So one person was dreaming of a time when they sent the words in those special title shots. The caption or the words underneath that so that they could see that, the caption underneath. What's sad is that technology, there was no motivation for the deaf people to be included in the design. It was a different era, a different time. So fast forward 50 years, no caption, nothing. Until they found the 70s. When they knew about involving deaf people, when that occurred, and then there was captioning. Slowly it rose until the 90s when it, they required caption on all TVs. And now captioning is in everything. 40% of users every day for many different reasons. Facebook, all those different aspects, it's really changed. So, the design for the deaf is all important. Now, next slide. So here you can see the increase in caption users. All deaf, 96%, we know why. 40%, 4% don't use it, we don't know why. We'll never know. And then hearing, we notice 20%. Netflix, as I said, and broadcast TV, regular TV. It's a lot, it's a big number. And it continues to increase over time. Next slide, please. So now, Here's about the captioning. The eye gaze goes back and forth. It's how we see the captions. There are two different ways to show them captions. Maybe they're uh, set up through a projector or through glasses. There are different, program, different policies, different ways to do it, to connect the captions with the person if possible, or to identify who is speaking. Because one important aspect, the auditory and the visual connecting those 
is people hear and they can identify who's speaking, but it's hard to identify who's speaking in captioning. The positive is it's becoming easier to read between the person when it's close up. Secondly, next slide, please. So that shows what's being sent out in captioning. You notice that you see that explanation at the bottom and you see what's happening up there. So I have a funny story about that. I captioned this class, I asked questions with one deaf student and 30 hearing students. So then the deaf student withdrew from the class. So then I decided through to with the captions, I would stop and the whole class complained. They did not want the captions taken down. They wanted to keep the captions. They wanted that whole system. Why? Because they appreciated the option of using the captions as a backup. If, for example, they misunderstood, misheard something, whatever the, the presentation was, the captions were a double check. So that was nice, that was fine. And I found a different deaf student, three lines of captioning, and the hearing people wanted six lines of captioning because they had a different way to use the captioning. They wanted the history of captioning to go way up. If they missed something, then the deaf student wanted the person what was being currently said, what was being said now. So that went back to the point of the flexibility in the design for the visually impaired, for the, for the people who are using the captions. So then they needed more flexibility. So the deaf people said that they wanted it to be different. So obviously they were stuck with one design that they all had to share and they were all using that visual design, but they were using it with glasses. So then each student chose what method of interpreting they wanted. It didn't matter whether it was three lines or six lines of captions. So they got to choose what they wanted. So that's how we think about the design meshing. Next slide. It's important that we also think about when it comes to eye gaze, when it comes to projection versus glasses, that we think about where the person is speaking and where the captions are appearing. So in a situation like this, you may wanna think about the captions possibly following the speaker or, or being located above the person that is speaking so you can identify who it is that's talking. Next slide, please. So to wrap up, the thing to focus on is inclusivity and active participation. What that means is having those individuals co-design instead of thinking about what somebody else needs developing a technology and just giving it to them and saying here you go you're welcome ask them what it is that they would like to see and what they need and design this technology with them next slide please
When you think about user-centered design, we have to think about the spectrum of users. We can design things with the most inclusivity in mind as possible, rather than designing things at one end of the spectrum, like only for visual or only for auditory users. Like 50 years ago, you know, some of this technology is like 50 years ago, we had a TTY where you'd have to type in everything into the phone. Now we've got interpreters on the screen, which is much more design inclusive for deaf individuals. They can access all these things visually now much, much quicker than they ever could. So we imagine that in the future, this technology will be expanded even further and there's an infinite number of possibilities. Next slide, please. When you think about inclusivity in design, one of the ways we do this is through industry and practice as well as through research. We're looking at technology that can impact everyday lives. So I work at Gallaudet, which is a deaf, a primarily deaf university. And I have access to all these people. Currently about 100 million, 116 million people use live transcribe. The feedback for this product came from the deaf individuals at Gallaudet University. We had research on the campus there where we were able to get feedback from individuals in order to make the technology better. Many years ago, captioning had to be done by a person who would sit there and listen and type everything. Now, technology like Live Transcribe is making that obsolete and making the technology much, much better. Another example is the telephone. Through research, we were able to make the telephone more inclusive for deaf and hard of hearing individuals as well. Next slide, please. Uh, it's stuck. I'm, I'm trying to. Oh, that actually, actually, that may be the last slide. Yeah. Okay. So I want to uh, conclude here. I want to leave enough time for questions. So please, the floor is open. Okay. Give me a moment. And you can stop sharing. Does anyone have any questions? So please write your question or you can interrupt and yeah. Hi, Roger, this is Dylan. Um, Want to say thanks so much for, for coming and giving this talk. It's our amazing solutions. Um, I'm, I'm very curious, how much do you think the, the solutions that we're talking about here that are helpful for kind of real life scenarios like classrooms, um, how much how much that crosses over and overlaps with some of the solutions we've been talking about for uh, virtual reality captioning? There is definitely a lot of overlap, but there are some design differences as well. So. If you remember at the beginning of the presentation, I mentioned the differences between auditory and visual um, information and the characteristics of somebody who listens to information versus receives information visually. So VR is focused on, um, what the, the VR set is focused on what's right in front of you. So, We need to develop new ideas and new paradigms for VR, which has already started. Um, there's a lot of different meetings. There's a lot of different research. There's a lot of different products in development. Um, so thanks to XR, that is happening now. Um, there's a lot of research groups that are addressing these different questions. From, oh, I see another question from, uh, I apologize if I pronounce your name wrong, Ma Jazz. Uh, is it good to have sign language interpreters and captions in an XR environment? Yes, um, because you can't predict things like how much ambient noise there's going to be. 
Um, we don't know about privacy screens necessarily. Uh, so having both is what I'm speaking about in terms of the balance of visual and auditory information and people can rely on the information in, in the modality that they need. So we have closed captions um, that would definitely be beneficial to show people what, uh, to help people get the information that they need. If we show captions all the time, time, some people may see that as visual noise. Some people may be distracted by it. But again, it speaks to that idea that there's no perfect design. If 40% if of people use captions, it means 60% of people don't use captions. So for those 60%, yeah, it could be considered visual noise. Um, so about vibrotactile designs. So the challenge with tactile is that you can get pretty limited information. Uh, so far, tactile communication has been used mostly for information, like environmental information rather than direct communication. Um, People aren't necessarily used to tactile modalities communication, except maybe like being tapped on the shoulder to get someone's attention. Um, I think people may get more used to it over time. And as people get, uh, especially with like the vibration setting on phones for notifications, people are getting more used to vibration. We used to have to be really careful with tactile design and use it to integrate visual information into tactile modalities. What I mean by that is if you have like a doorbell uh, and you add a tactile, like a left or right sensor, then you know where the noise is coming from. In other words, it can help you locate the source of a sound possibly, but that technology is still very, very early in its development. I think it has more potential to be integrated more thoroughly into everyday communication. And then that would be sort of the third modality, visual, auditory, tactile. Um, there are some tactile watches that vibrate to alert people of inf information, but a lot of it is notification based. So the technology there really does need to improve. So you're talking about AI, um, definitely. You can have uh, these unique accommodations with AI that, that fit particular situations and individuals. Um, it's one of the great benefits is that you could uh, modify to fit a particular situation. For example, AI right now can have, uh, can incorporate uh, information like identifying speakers, identifying background noise, source of source of noises, things like that. Um, right now, it's still a lot of manual communication between two people, but um, it is in, it is in the works and it is getting better. So you have to do this. You have to do um, this module switching between the two. Do we have any more questions? Uh, actor. Um, hi, Dr. Roger. <laughs> nice to meet you. Uh, it was a great talk. Um, 
So I just wanted to know about um, something different from um, what other question is. It's about the like emotion inclusion in captioning, uh, because what uh, we have seen while conducting few research in this specific scope that uh, expressing emotions sometimes might uh, incorporate some uh, like discrepancy in uh, like deaf and hard of hearing individuals getting information out of a caption. Uh, so it's kind of more of like how they are capturing information from captioning. So if we think of including emotion as a text, then it might, uh, like, although it might improve the, express the emotion of the text, but it might also some include some noise in participants reading caption, like it might uh, reduce their speed of reading caption or something like that. So do you have any specific, uh, like recommendation in that regard or any idea about that? Yeah, um, so so captions are more designed for information rather than communication. So when you type for communication, like we add emojis or or uh, you know something similar to express the tone. It's like in text message. Sometimes it's hard to understand someone's tone, but it is a very very important question, and I think that AI is helpful in that because people are using AI to detect uh, things like tone, emotion to use captions more for communication rather than just information. It, it is a big area of research. Um, it's something that needs a lot more research, but yeah, XR has potential there as well. Thank you. We tend to spotlight both the sign language interpreters and the, both interpreters, the speaker and the interpreter. And that's another example today of um, SW communication. It's not a good design to see everything for, vis for complete visual access. The spotlight hurt, hurts that. The pan light is still, it's a pain. It's time, so thank you. Okay, so Rajan needs to go now, but we are very happy to have you all here. Um, we would like to have you for the next month and uh, look out for our invitation there. We will be sending emails, uh, sharing it on Twitter and our, on, new, on our typical channels, like in Slack. Stream.